cool stuff. So are you ready for like the least technical session of the two days? That, that, yeah, that's what's about to happen. Um, so as he mentioned, my name is Rebecca. So probably no one in here knows me. So here's all the ways that you can harass me on the internet. Uh, and he did mention that I do have a job. So magically money appears in my, my account every two weeks. So that's the thing that I'm most appreciative of uh, on this particular slide. But before, uh, you know, I started doing podcasting and writing and, you know, just doing general technologist type stuff, um, I spent five very long and very short years uh, in the Marine Corps. Yeah, that's usually the reaction I get when I say that is, hmm, that's how I feel about it too. Hmm. Uh, why did I do that at 17? I could not tell you, but it seemed like a really great idea at the time. Uh, and if you're looking for me up there, because I know it's camouflage, just look for the most pale person, and you will find me. Um, so when I first got out of the Marine Corps, I decided I wasn't going to talk about it. I didn't feel comfortable talking about it. I didn't want to get the, the questions of, so how many people have you killed? I'm like, that's weird. Don't ask people that. Because um, <laughs> no matter what I say, you're not going to like the answer. Like, if I'm like, none, they're like, <laughs> What did you do, computer stuff? I'm like, yeah, right? Or if I'm like, a lot, and they're like, that's weird too. So I'm like, just don't, right? So I just like, I'm not gonna talk about it. We're gonna avoid this topic completely. And then a few, about a year ago, I decided, you know, I've actually learned a tremendous amount of things from my time in the service. Many of that being technical things, but a lot of that also being very non-technical skill sets that I have found have been very, very important in my career. Um, so I'm going to share some of those things with you today. So who has heard the term natural born leader? Yeah, everybody. Who thinks that people are naturally born a leader? One person raised their hand. Um, so that's bullshit. Okay, so I'm, I, I think I should have come with a warning label. They're like, was in the Marine Corps for five years, definitely swears like a Marine. Um, so I will, I will try to limit my vocabulary today um, to, to just that one bad word. But that, that's, it's, that's total BS. Nobody pops out of the womb a leader. They're not just like, yeah, leading things at daycare. No, that doesn't happen, right? <laughs> it doesn't happen. Just like in the Marine Corps, nobody just day one is a leader. So when you, when, you, when you join the military, uh, and I can only speak for the Marine Corps here, um, the first thing you start learning is about leadership. When you're a private, even before you're a private, when you're a recruit and you are nobody, right? You get taught leadership principles, and you have to memorize them. And at any point in time, a higher ranking person could come up to you and say, recite, give me five of the 11 leadership principles. Recite all of the 11 leadership principles. But that's not where we stop. There's also leadership traits, 14 of them. This one, of course, military. Um, we love acronyms. You learned about FUBAR earlier today. Um, so this one is JJ did tie buckle. I don't know who JJ is, and I surely do not know how you tie a buckle. But that's how you remember this, right? And at any point in time, you could be asked to recite this. Every single year, the Commandant of the Marine Corps publishes a reading list per rank and says these are important for you to read and to learn. And it's all about honing and becoming a leader because no one is born a leader. But everybody should be and could be a leader. Okay. I had the privilege of working, did you want me to go back for you? <laughs> um, I had the privilege of working for a three-star general for about three months, and that's probably as much as I could take because it's not really fun standing like this, you know, all day pretty much. Um, but I learned a lot from him, and at one point he said this, self-interest is the cost of leadership, and that stuck with me. And the point to me saying this is there is a major difference between somebody who has authority and someone who is a leader. It's a magic thing when those things are one. You have authority and you're a leader. Yay! We're all going to be very happy, but the reality is, is that you've got pe people who are absolute amazing leaders and who have zero percent authority. And you have people who have a lot of authority and are jerks, right? And have zero leadership skills. And that's a real problem. And I hope that we can solve that together. It's not going to be something that we do today, 
but maybe over time, this can be something that we work on, right? Because leadership is not about you. That's the point of this quote. It's not about you at all. It's about the people you're leading. It's about the people who are equal to you, the people who are subordinate to you. It is about their, in so their interests. It's about their career growth. It's about their development. Because if you're a leader, you're a mentor, period. Those are intertwined. You're not going to have one without the other. So you have 40 hours a week that you're working with these people. <laughs> Nobody works 40 hours. We're in tech, right? Like 55. Um, so you've got these hours that you're with these people, and it's about them. And you have all the rest of the week, all the weekend, all the things to work on you, right? Because it's not about you when you're a leader. Okay. So I'm going to boil down leadership, this massive, insane discussion, into seven things that I have found make a good leader. Okay. This is my opinion. Feel free to disagree. Feel free to agree, and we can high-five later. Okay. Um, but this is what I've found in my experience make a good leader. So the first one is self-awareness, and um, this is absolutely by far the, my favorite image that you're going to see in this presentation. So if you have not watched Community, I highly encourage you to watch it, but stop after season three. And you, <laughs> you will thank me, okay? Stop at season three. But self-awareness, this is really important. One of, I'm going to, spoiler alert, one of the other qualities is building a collaborative team. But how can you build a collaborative team if you're not aware of your own shortcomings and your own strengths? Right? We have to work together. So part of that is understanding where I suck and where I'm great. That way I can build a collaborative team and try and find complementary people to accomplish this mission with. Right? But this is something that's ever evolving. Um, for me personally, I have thought since the beginning of my career that I sucked at storage. I was just like, I don't, I'm terrible. I don't, I don't know. I don't get it. I don't know it. And I studied and I studied and I studied and I studied storage. And then last year, I did this um, certification called the VMware Certified Design Expert. And it's sort of like doing, by no means it pales in comparison, but it's kind of like doing a PhD. We have to like write this massive amount of documentation and then stand up in front of a panel and defend this enterprise architecture that you just designed. And I stepped in front of that panel, and I got asked about storage. I aced it. I was like, yeah, I felt like a million bucks. I was like, dang, I do know storage. And then they started hammering me on networking. The thing that I thought I was really strong in, I had become weak in networking because I'd focused so much on the things that I had perceived. Unfortunately, I learned that at the wrong time. <laughs> I learned that in front of the panel. Wow, I suck at networking now, great. Um, and so this is something that we always have to be doing, right? We have to always be aware, and we have to reevaluate ourselves every so often and reevaluate the people on our teams. In my opinion, this is the hardest one. Things change. Who's learned something brand new today that they're like, oh, huh, yeah, I did. I learned something. And we're going to learn something new tomorrow. And then we're going to go, I should really spend some time researching that and digging into that. But we just established that none of us work 40 hours. That sounds like an ideal job. Let me know if they're hiring, 40 hours only. And then we have lives, and probably a lot of you have children. And where do I fit in study time? Right? That's a hard part, and that's something that I struggle with all the time. And I don't have a great answer here. I can only tell you that I block off. I work for a lovely Silicon Valley startup. No one shows up to work until like 9, 30, 10. I'm a morning person. This is awesome for me. This is awesome because my engineering team shows up at like 9.30. I'm up at 5.30. I get so much work done before they show up. It's, it's, it's amazing. But part of that, I block off an hour every morning between 7 and 8 to study. And that might just be me reading a blog post, me reading a chapter in a book, and that might be me playing in my home lab. Right? But that's the only way that I can do it is if I put it in my calendar because for me personally, I live and die by the calendar. But think about it. Your subordinates are going to come to you, right? Those people on your team are going to come to you, and you need to have the answers. And it's okay to say, I don't know. That's not a sign of weakness. 
but the next thing out of your mouth should be, let me find out. Right? Don't just stop it, I don't know. Let me find out. And so part of that's going to be continually learning, right? And re-evaluating our skill sets and re-evolving our careers every so often, right? Because this DevOps thing is not new, right? I'm using air quotes because I'm, I'm a jerk. I'm sorry, I don't know. I, it, it felt like the right thing to do at the time. Um, DevOps is not new, but this is new for a lot of people, this idea, right? Part of it is sharing knowledge, right? So share what you know, and you can learn from others. Being decisive, this, I mean, all of these seem pretty obvious, right? The, the, the skill, though, is using these different qualities at the right time. Decisiveness is also an important quality. Uh, in the Marine Corps, uh, you go to corporal's course and you go to sergeant's course because um, that's when you're considered a non-commissioned officer and you're holding more of a leadership billet. Um, so when I was in sergeant's course, because um, I got out of the Marine Corps as a sergeant, uh, one of the things that they taught you was something that they called the 75% method. And this is for combat, so this is probably not exactly applicable to you in here. Um, but the, the goal is to get as much information as you can until you hit about 75%. When you have about 75% of the information, make a decision. Because the other 25% is going to be made up with experience, intuition, other teammates, right? And you have to make a decision. Because if you wait too long, then what? Right? Of course, in the Marine Corps, it's very much life or death. Hopefully, unless you work for like healthcare or like a, I don't know, an airline, probably what you do is not life or death, right? But this is still going to impact you because if you wait too long, is that job, that dream job available still? If you sit there and go, well, is it enough money? I don't know. And you sit there and you go back and forth, right? Or, hey, you get this lovely quote from a vendor, but then you sit on it and you sit on it and you sit on it, trying to decide which vendor you want to go with, and now the quote magically expired and it's more expensive. Dang it, right? Make a decision. There's very, very few things in life that you can't undo, right? It's better to make a decision than to sit there in a state of purgatory. Problem solving. Again, seems kind of like, an, yeah, that makes sense. Who in here has lived as a VMware or a virtualization administrator? I saw somebody this morning who had like a VMworld backpack. I was like, hey. Uh, if anybody went to VMworld this year, one of the things that they may have noticed is that the keynotes were very much focused on the application, which is surprising for somebody going to a VMware conference that we're not talking about the underlying infrastructure. We're in DevOps days. We know this already. We know that the infrastructure is a consumable endpoint. I don't care if you're using a HV or a VMware or Hyper-V, I don't care. Because if I'm the end user and I go, hmm, I'm really hungry and I order food on Uber Eats, I really don't give a care in the world. Oof. <laughs> <laughs> that was a close one. I don't give a care in the world what the underlying infrastructure works or looks like. I don't. I care that my payment gets submitted securely and I care that the food shows up when it says it's supposed to show up, right? It doesn't matter what the infrastructure is. And I think people are starting to realize that. But the problem is that a lot of these you know, infrastructure guys kind of are going to gonna get left behind because they realize that too late. Don't be afraid to step outside of your comfort zone. That's what I'm going with. When you go, here's the problem, how do I solve it? Don't go with always what you know. It may not be the best solution, right? Look at other options. Figure out what else is out there, right? We just heard about Kubernetes and all kinds of really fun stuff with that. Hey, maybe that's something that we should be looking at. Okay. Teamwork makes the dream work, right? One of my friends was like, you will never be able to get Power Rangers in a presentation. I was like, challenge accepted. So <laughs> obviously, you know, maturity level, we're still working on that one. Um, but teamwork, this is really important, okay? And to kind of tie a lot of things together really quickly, I worked for a uh, gunnery sergeant in the Marine Corps, and that probably means nothing to you in terms of rank, but uh, on the enlisted side, there's nine ranks. A gunnery sergeant is rank number seven. So he's, he's up there. He's probably been in 16-ish years. So he knows things, or she knows some things. She knows some things, right? Um, and I was a sergeant, so I was rank five. 
he annoyed me so much. I thought he was like micromanaging me at the time because I was just like, oh my, stop asking me questions. I'm trying to get work done. But what I figured out after working with him for several years is that he had self-awareness because he realized that he was very much in a managerial position at that point. And he was lost in the sauce when it came to the actual technical details. So he wasn't trying to micromanage me. He was trying to understand what in the heck we were doing because he was the person trying to make all of the decisions for us. And that's really scary when you go, I don't know what the heck's going on, but I have to make the decision. Right? So he was very much trying to build this collaborative team where he didn't have to come to us and get answers and ask questions, where we would start offering information and working together. That way he could make the best decision for us. And that was really important. Right? That was really important for our team, and we ended up gelling very, very well because even though we were lower ranking than this person, he could absolutely tell us to shut up and go do something not a lot of fun. Um, <laughs> I'm trying to, like again, keep PG language here. Um, he didn't. He valued our opinions. He was very much more of a democratic leader. At the end of the day, if he said, shut up, do this, we'd shut up and we did it because we had a massive amount of respect for this man. But he was trying to build this collaborative team where you felt the ability to have your opinion heard. And may, he may not choose that option, or he may not even think that's a great idea at all, but you had the ability to say it, right? And you had the ability to work together, and that's really important. Who in here has failed something? Oh man, the first time I did this presentation, I asked that and nobody raised their hand. I was like, liars, all of you. Um, yeah, uh, we've all failed something. So um, I don't know how this happened for me, but I somehow made it through most of my life without failing anything. <laughs> I don't know. I made it through school. Just I was like the I was the jerk student who was like, Psh, I don't have to study, and then I would make good grades. And my little sister would be like, ah, oh, and hate me. I don't think she's forgiven me yet. Um, joined the military. I was just good at things. And then I got out and I decided, you know what, maybe I will stick with this tech thing that I've been doing in the military. And I went to go take my first certification exam outside the military, outside of them paying. This is my own money now, right? <laughs> and I failed it. And at this point, I'm like 23 and I'm experiencing failure for the first time. And let me tell you, I did not handle it well. Um, I'm not, when I get upset, I'm not like a cry kind of person. I'm like a get angry kind of person. I'm gonna take it out on everyone. So I'm very sorry to my sister again. Um, and I very much like was talking to this person that I knew um, who was very, in my opinion, very successful. And I was kind of like be my mentor because um, I wanna make money. and. He, he, he did not put up with my crap at all. <laughs> I was like, I can't, maybe I don't, maybe I shouldn't be in tech. Maybe I can't hack it. Maybe I, maybe I should just go to law school like I was going to do anyway before you convinced me I was good at this. And I very much like lashed out at him and he pretty much just set me down and said, stop being a child. As you can imagine, that did not sit well with me. Um, I was like, what do you mean being a child? And he, he, he's like, you didn't fail. If you quit, then you fail. Yeah, you didn't pass the exam, but life goes on. Everybody fails things. And I guarantee when you pass it, you're going to have learned way more by failing it and figuring out what you did wrong and then going back and trying again than you would ever do by passing it the first time, just kind of easing your way through life, which I had been doing up until that point. And that was a really important life lesson for me. And I got to give that back to him last year because he failed something monumental in his career. And I was like, no, I didn't do that. I was like, uh, he didn't take it well. And I was just like, man, do it again. And he was like, man. I was like, yeah, it's not really smart, but I'm just saying things that you already said to me, right? But think about it from like a leadership perspective. You're going to fail as a leader at some point. I know that I failed as a leader. I know I have. I'm not going to stand up here and pretend like I'm the perfect leader and that you should all follow my example. No. There were times when I was in the Marine Corps where somebody screwed up and I came down way too hard on them and I should have shown some mercy. And then there was times where I showed mercy and I should have shown them, like, my boot. We'll say that. I was trying to think of, again, appropriate, appropriate language here. You're going to fail as a leader. And your subordinates and your teammates, they're going to fail. 
And I don't believe in this like fail fast, fail, no, nobody wants to fail. I don't want to fail, that sucks, it doesn't feel good. But when you do fail, what you want is the people on your team going, it's okay, do it again. It's okay, you didn't let us down, man, just do it again, right? Because when you fail as a leader, if you don't have that kind of open, accepting culture, they're gonna eat you alive when you fail and you're the one in charge, right? So be accepting. This one sounds a little bit ridiculous, right? Agreed. I will never ever memorize this, so I wrote it down. A sense of humor is part of the art of leadership, of getting along with people, of getting things done, end quote. Do you know who said that? Dwight D. Eisenhower? I mean, among many things, you know, thank you for the interstate system, that's one thing. Um, but, you know, kind of an important guy, five-star general in the Army, D-Day, president, right? He might know a thing or two about leadership. And if he's saying, it's okay to make jokes, hmm, I'm going to take, take him up on that offer. Because at the end of the day, with leadership, what you're trying to do is you're trying to build trust. You need to trust your subordinates, and in return, they're going to trust you back. And when you have that level of trust, you're able to do these things like build a collaborative team, like think outside the box, because they're gonna go, you know what, that sounds crazy, but I trust you, do it. We're in tech, we're not doing what we call buddy rushes. Does anybody know what a buddy rush is? It's where you run ahead of your team while they're firing weapons and then you drop to the ground, and then the next person runs past you where you're firing your weapon and providing cover, and then they jump down. We're not doing that, right? But that's a great example of you have to trust the other person. We have to trust the other people in our team. And having a sense of humor when things go wrong, that's one way to start building that authentic trust. So to sum it up, leaders make more leaders, right? This whole like one, one chief and everybody else is an Indian is a very politically incorrect way of saying this opposite of this idea. I don't agree with it. I think we can all be leaders and we all should be leaders. Even if that just means we set the example. Because the best leaders I saw in the military were my peers. And sometimes the people below me. And I learned just as much from them as I did from the people above me. Right? So create more leaders. Empower those around you. And if you go, I don't know what I'm supposed to be doing here, act as if you do. Act as if you've been there before. So the easy way for me is I just go, what would this person do? What would Brett do? What would Gunnery Sergeant Aw Miller do in this exact scenario? Or if that doesn't work for you because you don't have that role model, that leader that you look up to, think of the terrible person. You go, wow, that person really sucks. And then do the opposite of what you think that they would do. Okay, <laughs> That's another way to do it. I've done that one a lot. And the most important takeaway here is you're all leaders.